Hello everyone. Um, my name is Alan Plivnik. I'm a partner with Watson Filing Williams in the Bangkok office and I'd like to welcome you to our transport webinar today. Um, this is the first uh, of the aviation ones that we're doing and uh, we're covering in this a range of topics, uh, not just aviation but maritime and rail um, and issues of the moment. Today's is the first of three episodes covering aviation and we'll be looking at the very current topic of restructurings. Um, before we start, I'd like to just run through some housekeeping notes. Um, participant video and audio have been disabled to minimize interruptions. If you would like to ask a question or comment on anything that our presenters are saying, please use the Q&A function and we'll either uh, respond during the Q&A or afterwards uh, in writing, or you can contact one of the speakers um, directly following the event. Um, I should also tell you that the webinar is going to be recorded. Um, what I'd like to now do is uh, introduce my uh, esteemed panel. Um, first, we have Stefan Krastev, who has 20 years of experience in the aviation, aerospace, aircraft leasing industries. Over the course of his career, he has been involved in a variety of situations encompassing complex airline and aircraft restructurings, private equity and debt placements, aircraft financings, and M&A. Uh, next, we have David Soden, who's a partner in the restructuring team of Deloitte in London. He has over 17 years experience in London and Dubai in international insolvency assignments. He works on both formal insolvencies, and, excuse me, and in an advisory capacity, performing complex security operation reviews, asset-based insolvency valuations, and advising boards through the zone of insolvency. I'm also joined by Stephen Parker, uh, from our London office, who's a partner in the Restructuring and Insolvency Group, and Dominic Pearson, who's a partner in our Asset Finance Group. So, uh, gentlemen, uh, without further ado, let's dive in at the deep end. Um, one of the things that strikes me about what we're doing in airline restructuring is that COVID-19 is probably the first global uh, in, uh, the first pandemic, the first issue that's globally affected the aviation sector. We have airlines all over the world that have had to shut down or reduce operations. And for lessors and airlines, they're having to deal with a global situation and a global problem. So in that context, um, Stefan, I'm going to start with you, if I may, please. In terms of the strategies taken by airlines uh, in relation to the long-term restructuring, of, of their, their relationships with the lessors and their creditors. What exactly are you seeing? What trends are emerging? Unmute yourself. And my apologies. Uh, thank you, Alan. And thank everyone. Um, if I can, uh, just for a quick uh, second or two, uh, frame this a little more. Uh, you obviously mentioned that uh, we all believe this is uh, an unprecedented crisis. We uh, in the aviation industry, of course, have uh, been accustomed to uh, the very cyclical nature of uh, this industry. And over the last 30 uh, years or so, we have seen a number of different uh, downturns uh, going all the way back to the early 90s and the Gulf War, uh, September 11th, um, and uh, the, uh, of course, the Great Depression in 2008. Uh, but nothing uh, close to the levels that we uh, are seeing today. Um, uh, this is an all-encompassing um, um, uh, crisis, uh, which, of course, uh, has touched every part of the industry um, equally. Um, and we've seen global air traffic demand collapsing uh, and uh, bottoming out uh, in April uh, of this year. However, we've seen a very slow recovery since. Um, and as of most recently, we've seen that um, uh, close to 70% of all scheduled uh, flights have been canceled. Uh, this is as recent as September. The only outlier in that was China, uh, where we saw a drop of about only 20%. Um, and um, not surprisingly, wide-body aircraft are uh, massively more effective than the narrow bodies. Again, back um, uh, looking at September, uh, we see a drop of about 75% uh, year-over-year -over -year capacity reduction uh, in the wide-body fleet uh, compared to, you know, 50% on the narrow bodies. 
Um, so uh, just to, to, to give you a sense of what we're thinking and what we're seeing uh, out there in terms of the way forward, uh, uh, a general consensus is that we probably are looking at um, achieving close to 70 percent uh, of uh, 2019 levels uh, flying uh, no earlier than three to four years from now, which means, uh, of course, that if you take that in the context of a global fleet, uh, uh, of close to 21,000 aircraft, you know, we're looking at excess aircraft of somewhere between five to 7,000. Uh, so that's a, it's a massive number uh, that we all have to contend with uh, should that uh, come true. Uh, as uh, probably expected, uh, most of these uh, aircraft uh, will be wide body dominant, older equipment. Um, and all of this, of course, on the backdrop of COVID continuing to uh, rage across the, the globe. Um, we just passed the 40 million uh, mark globally of infections uh, with no signs of um, uh, uh, slowing down. In fact, the uh, uh, seven day rolling averages that we're seeing across major aviation markets uh, have reached all time highs. So, that is, that is what we're dealing with. And uh, if you look at what air, airlines have done um, uh, throughout the pandemic, uh, uh, undoubtedly all this, uh, this has all affected everyone around us. Uh, some airlines have been affected more than others, uh, but the bottom line is that everyone has done everything possible to uh, improve their liquidity positions. Um, uh, to use a cliche, uh, you know, airlines are, hoping for the best, but planning for the worst. Uh, some airlines have resorted to um, levering up every uh, marketable and financeable asset they have uh, without going into restructuring activities. Um, uh, others, of course, had to resort to restructuring activities. And um, we have seen or have been involved or actually currently involved in uh, a variety of uh, restructuring ranging from consensual out-of-court arrangements uh, involving concessions um, in the form of uh, rent deferrals, um, you know, all the way on the other side of the spectrum, uh, uh, we have the court-supervised processes uh, in the context of uh, you know, Chapter 11 uh, of the Bankruptcy Code. Um, what we're um, also seeing is that airlines are more consistently um, asking us and they're more inquisitive on the benefits and the drawbacks of uh, the chapter 11 process. Um, um, a lot of the uh, restructuring activity that we're seeing now is centered around Asia. Uh, South America led the way of course with uh, one of the high profile chapter 11 cases of Latam and Avianca and you know, Mexico. And frankly, we wouldn't be surprised if the activity uh, shortly increases uh, in Europe next. Uh, going back to what airlines have done, uh, the uh, deferrals that I referred to uh, uh, were negotiated early in the process, and they usually took the form of three months of rental deferrals and up to uh, six months of uh, debt um, um, structured deferrals. Um, in some instances, though, we've seen airlines actually getting more than that, and uh, that is usually when uh, the airline itself had a viable business model prior to uh, the pandemic, and um, uh, their creditors actually, uh, specifically the lessor lender community, um, is seeing that this airline will recover uh, post-pandemic, and they're obviously uh, betting on, on that fact. Um, most importantly to us, though, uh, based on our experience, is that uh, many airlines, uh, unfortunately, have taken a very one-sided approach in, in their uh, restructurings, uh, and they're concentrating on one specific uh, uh, creditor class, and that tends to be the lessor lender community. Uh, in our experience, um, this one-sided approach has never really worked uh, well. Um, we've seen uh, situations where um, comprehensive approaches of ride-sizing uh, the airline uh, the airline's operations uh, and looking at issues holistically actually has have been the most successful um, and um, uh, really bringing everyone together uh, to 
pull in the same direction. Uh, with the ultimate goal, of course, is to, to get to the point uh, uh, where uh, uh, you know airline and creditor interests converge. That's I think how we've seen things. Thanks, Stefan. Um, David, if I if I could turn to you now and ask you your views on on these long term strategies. Uh, I, I mean, some of the things that come out of, came out of what Stefan said, for example, the the the, the wide body versus narrow body. Um, and, and the, the issues between airlines that were in a good financial position beforehand and obviously have better prospects. What exactly are you seeing in all of that? Yeah, I mean, look, I think a lot to echo a lot of what, what Stefan was saying, you know, we've seen this in, in three fairly uh, separate waves. There was the original wave of deferrals, um, which kind of worked for all parties, you know, I think from a, from a lessor perspective. That was okay, uh, you know, as long as they got a little extra interest and perhaps a fee, you know, for an already rich lessor, a cash rich lessor group, that was that was acceptable. Um, but then, sort of, second wave became changing those um, deferrals into waivers, um, moving to revenue based payments or power by the hour rather than fixed contractual leases. Um, all in recognition that this wasn't really in control of the airlines uh, or within the gift of the airlines about when they restart flying. And so we've been trying to, you know, come up with solutions that, uh, you know, in a situation where nobody really knows where it's going to restart. Um, and that sort of waiver period has been good for airlines and, and okay for lessors, we would say, sort of for a limited period. You know, on the one hand, they may not be getting paid, but equally the asset isn't being used. And so there's no sort of burn rate on, on, on the asset value. But again, it's not really a sustainable solution. You know, it works for an interim period to start to, to see when the, the industry can recover, but it's not, gonna, it's not going to fix it in the long term. And then from what we are seeing, uh, we're sort of entering into the third wave, which is, which is more comprehensive restructures. Again, sort of echoing what Stephen was saying around um, a more comprehensive and uh, a group focused around all of the stakeholders, not focusing on you know the, the stakeholders that the airlines know best, which is you know, always the first port of call was, was the lessors. Um, but now, sort of getting all of the finance parties around the table is becoming more uh, more normal. Again, you know, question whether that's sustainable. You know, even if you take 20, 30, 40 percent off your uh, operating costs. You know that doesn't replace a 70% drop in in income, um, so I think there's some some interesting uh, outcomes to come. You know, potentially with with Asia leading the way, uh, as Stefan was saying. I think there is sort of a saving grace from an from an industry perspective, though, on two fronts. One that it's critical infrastructure, and so it's needed, and it's got government support at differing levels around the globe. Um, but also the stakeholders involved are all um, largely interrelated. You know, there are there are numerous airlines and lessors, but there are less numerous aviation banks uh, and very few OEMs. So whilst we are sort of transferring pain around the, the, the supply chain, uh, you know, we do need to come up with a solution that works for all. And there are, you know, a, a limited number of um, stakeholders that that can, can, can be worked around. Thank you. Um, I might then turn to Stephen Parker um, in, in London. Stephen, following on from that, I mean, one of the issues we're looking at then for in terms of the all the airlines are facing similar issues, they're all trying to deal with this in similar and get a variety of different ways. In terms of the legal regimes, what's, what, what do they show us? Okay, how can they help us uh, understand what's the best for airlines and for, for lessors and other creditors? I was doing exactly the same as my near namesake and not 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 turning on my mic but i realized um it's it's a very interesting question alan and i think um uh what has clearly been um driving things up until now perhaps has been bilateral negotiations and consensual deals the 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 the, the deferrals and the waivers that, that david was referring to um what i think we will probably start to see now um perhaps to a degree in the third wave and and, and maybe it's a fourth wave is, as you say, more, more formal processes. Um, and I think basically that, that boils down to, to, to three broad options. There's the local regime um, for restructuring and insolvency in the jurisdiction in which the airline is based. Um, I have to say that the experience shows that that's often not an optimal option. 
Um, it very often has led to the end of the airline and effectively its liquidation, um, although it may offer an opportunity for a sale. Um, and, and I think we saw that obviously with Virgin Australia, um, that, that that was was the route out there. Um, but it might also be used to, to, to affect a restructuring, but where I say it is suboptimal, and I think I probably just need to refer to Alitalia as, as, as one obvious example of, of a local process that seems to have gone on forever. Um, and I suspect in Asia, that will also be the case that um, you will have local processes that um, become somewhat mired in the quagmire. Um, and so that may not be the, the, the best option for, for all stakeholders. I think the other challenge that um, local processes and just generally formal insolvency processes um, uh, uh, create for, for, for the airline is, 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 is funding, um, funding to keep operations going. And I think one of the trends that you always see, um, particularly in Europe, is that there's always been government support as part of the solution around a formal insolvency process, um, particularly in Germany. Um, but that's not always, always there as an option which I think leads you on to the two big, um, if you like, global um, solutions. One of those is the new UK restructuring plan, which came in at the end of, of, of June this year, um, very closely um, based on, on the existing scheme of arrangement process. Um, and both the scheme and restructuring plan are very streamlined restructuring processes. They have the downside of there being no moratorium against creditor claims. So you need some level of, of creditor cooperation, but they are a way that allows a very focused approach to, to deal with, with, with classes of creditors rather than taking on all creditors. And I'll speak a little bit more about um, the restructuring plan um, uh, in a little while. But before that, I want to um, uh, just, just mention, I suppose, the daddy of them all, which is chapter 11, um, which Stefan sort of referenced for the Latin American airlines that, um, uh, are going through chapter 11 at the moment and that that is very different to a UK restructuring plan it's a much more all-encompassing bankruptcy process it can deal with funding requirements it's got the worldwide say um, and it can obviously deliver a restructuring plan as well so so broadly speaking you've got those three options and you can um, take your pick as to whether you think one or other is is, is, is the better course all right. Well, let's let's talk a little bit more about that the new UK plan because that's obviously in the news at the moment. Um, there are airlines that we, we think might try and use that relatively soon. Um, what what what's the what, what are some of the concerns about that, and how how do you think that's going to impact the market generally? So I think the the, the, the big concern is is actually why the plan was introduced, which is the whole concept that it will allow cross class cram down, which I always find a bit of a mouthful. Um, You've, you've got a, a, the existing scheme of arrangement process, you, you divided your creditors who were affected by the, by the scheme into classes and each class had to vote in favour. Um, it is a, an emerging trend, certainly in Europe. Um, we're going to see these types of processes across Europe. It's obviously been part of Chapter 11 for a long time. But the ability to cram down a dissenting class is clearly the absolute central part of what the restructuring plan is all about. Um, it's, it's clearly going to create a challenge for um, the market. It's, it, it's a major new tool in the toolbox, um, and it's going to offer up a lot of opportunities for companies, including airlines, to, to, to look at restructuring options. Um, it's, it's, um, it is, though, not a, a total panacea, and I think we're seeing various issues that we're we're working through as a legal community and as a as a community um, in the in the aviation industry at the moment to, to figure out how how best it will work, um, uh, and I think um, it's very important to focus on the fact that the dissenting class can't be worse off than it would be in what is rather technically termed the relevant um, alternative in, in in the act, which basically um, there'll be a lot of debate about what that actually is in practice. Um, at first blush, it's, it's, it's what would happen in liquidation, particularly in the local law jurisdiction of the, of the airline. Um, and that would take into account various factors in terms of what the existing rights are and, and not, say, stripping away existing rights. So I think there's a lot to be worked out around the restructuring plan, but it's, it's, it, 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 it's already been used with Virgin Atlantic. 
Um, that was the very first restructuring plan, and, and, and David and I worked very closely on that deal um, for, for a group of creditors. Um, and um, I think it's fair to say that, that that deal was almost entirely dependent for its negotiations on the fact that the restructuring plan was live and they could have done cross-class cram down. Um, that said, um, Virgin, I think, is a very particular restructuring because um, I can call it a restructuring or recapitalization. It was probably the first one to really wrestle with all the issues across the board. It took in trade creditors, it took in the revolving credit facility, it took in the lessors offering the lessors various options. Um, and, and so although there were four classes and they all voted in favor, um, it, 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 it wasn't doing a divide and conquer in quite the same way that we've seen suggested with 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 other um, other situations which might use the restructuring plan. Thank you, uh, Dominic. If I can if I can switch to you now, um, there are two things that, that came out of that. I, I thought we'd get some insight from you on. Number one um, was the divide and conquer, and wh whether this new UK plan, whether the, the fact that that airlines and lessors are all facing a, a global issue, will force some change in the way that that creditors relate to each other, and airlines and creditors relate to each other and coordinate. Um, but the the other part of this that I guess is also interesting is where does Cape Town fit in with all of this? Thank, thanks, Alan. I mean, I suppose just one initial observation um, before sort of going directly into those uh, questions is that um, I, I, I truly believe there is um, an awful lot yet to play out in all of this. Um, I think um, in the months and possibly years to come, um, things will move on and, and we'll see, unfortunately, many more um, airline restructurings and bankruptcies. Um, and so this is very much a, 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 you know, in some respects, a kind of a, a crystal ball gazing activity into how we think things will play out. Um, I don't think, um, given how many unknown factors uh, still remain, I don't think anyone can with any certainty uh, estimate um, where we'll be in a year's time or even a few months time. Um, so, um, I thought it was worth, maybe before jumping to Cape Town, um, maybe worth uh, sort of highlighting um, in, 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 in an in a, in a asset finance lawyer's perspective rather than restructuring lawyer's perspective, maybe some of the sort of high level differences that, that I see uh, between the UK plan and chapter 11. Um, and Stephen, please do uh, jump in if, if, if uh, if you have any detail to add. Um, I mean, we're often asked, you know, uh, particularly um, by those in North America, you know, well, do, is the UK plan a bit like chapter 11? And the answer is, is that um, yes and no, typical lawyer's answer, but um, yes, in the sense that um, it seems to be, or rather there seems to be a trend um, or a predicted trend um, that airlines will, will use a UK plan um, you know, even though the UK is not um, their uh, centre of main interest um, and, you know, not their kind of home state as most people would see that in the ordinary sense of the word. Um, but I guess the, you know, cost-wise, I think uh, most people accept that Chapter 11 is probably a lot more expensive um, than a UK plan proceeding uh, and restructuring would be. Um, but most importantly, sort of, uh, one observation is that um, unlike Chapter 11, where the court is a court of equity and is analyzing the substance of what the workout deal might be and essentially approving the substance of that um, as the debtor um, emerges from bankruptcy, um, the UK plan is much more like a kind of commercial voluntary uh, restructuring with a sort of a court wrapper around it. So the court sort of provides the procedural elements um, to this and obviously sanctions um, whatever the deal is that um, emerges. Um, of course, there's the creditor cram down aspects of it that are very important um, just to add into the mix. Um, but the difference is, is that with a UK plan, the court acts much more like a referee um, rather than a judge. Um, and so um, that can be um, 
that can be very helpful um, because it allows for a lot of flexibility um, within the process. Um, now, in terms of the creditor cram down um, options available to airlines and the cross creditor class cram down, real mouthful that, um, that Stephen um, alluded to in his uh, response a few moments ago, um, that obviously um, at first sight um, is a very useful tool for airlines um, or any debtor um, looking to um, uh, leverage off that off those rights in order to um, get the most out of uh, the proceedings. However, um, the elephant in the room in all of this is the Cape Town Convention, which um, you mentioned, Alan, and uh, specifically um, the anti cram down provision in the Cape Town Convention. Um, and that anti cram down provision, and I'm sort of horrendously simplifying, sim simplifying and paraphrasing, but that, but that anti cram down provision. Um, relates to any insolvency proceedings. And so the question becomes, is the UK plan an insolvency proceeding? Um, and this is the question that's been circulating among all the sort of major law firms in London and New York, you know, who regularly act as uh, deal counsel. Um, I think it's fair to say, um, certainly the view from those of us who, um, who, who uh, represent creditors and lessors most of the time, that it, it, it seems, pretty difficult to argue that, that, that a UK plan when used in this scenario, and this scenario being an airline in financial difficulties, um, is not an insolvency proceeding for Cape Town purposes. Um, and Alan, uh, sorry, um, Stephen touched upon um, another kind of important uh, feature of the UK plan, which, which is what the relevant alternative is. And I think that's another strong indicator um, that um, you know, were the court, and it, perhaps it would be um, quite soon, um, the court, you know, to, were the court to decide this, um, it, again, it, it seems hard where the relevant alternative is liquidation or some other process um, in the airline's home jurisdiction, um, that this isn't an insolvency proceeding. And so, um, you know, obviously, it's a question that still has to be answered by a court, um, but in my mind, and I think, um, you know, in terms of the, the asset finance practice here at Watson Farley, I think, I think we, uh, we would find it hard, hard to, um, hard to believe that a UK court would come to the opposite conclusion. Now, obviously, that answer, that, uh, that debate needs to be had um, in open court. Um, but that, you know, that's obviously um, quite a large legal issue kind of looming over <clears throat> the um, ability uh, of a debtor um, to use uh, UK plans, because um, if you remove the anti cram down provision from it, then it, it in most respects becomes much less attractive um, to an airline or a debtor than it otherwise would. Thank you. Um, I, I sit in Bangkok, which uh, where we don't have uh, any any prospect of joining Cape Town at the moment, and we have two airlines going through court supervised rehabilitation. So we have a slightly different uh, process here, but but one which can take several years um, if it plays out uh, slowly. Um, what, one thing that that does strike me from our involvement here in Thailand with the two airline rehabilitations is that the, there is this focus on on the lessors, both as the sort of answer and and both as, as the problem. And to some degree, uh, echoing what what Stefan said before, the the airlines look at the lessors as the place to make the savings, um, and and not necessarily look at other areas to do that. Uh, David has now alluded to the, the third wave where we're going to see a lot more structural change required. Um, Stefan and David, can, can I go back to you two now and ask you from a lessor's perspective, what are the strategies we're seeing? What, what are lessors doing here? Um, and what do you think they should be doing? Yeah, happy to, to jump in, Alan. I think, um, you know, it, it's quite a difficult um, question to answer in, in the context of, um, situations where there's, there's not necessarily a huge amount of coordination and it's probably worth just contextualizing the answer a little. 
which goes to a little bit of what Stephen and Dominic were saying, but, but what sits behind or beneath all of those processes is a requirement for a business to have a business plan that is viable. Um, and, and you need all of your stakeholders to buy into that viable business plan if it is going to mean there is some pain to each of the stakeholders. Um, and in order to garner their support, you need to make sure that that pain is, is equally shared or shared amongst a much broader group than just one, one set providing the solution. So I think from a, from a lessor perspective, there's a, a question around, you know, do you want to be aggressive or do you want to be relatively passive? If, if you want to be aggressive, you might get first mover advantage. You probably get your asset back. Um, and, uh, you know, there is, there is benefit in that. Does that cause a domino effect? And, and what are the wider impacts on the industry? You know, you have to consider that in, in that scenario. You know, there are some significant downsides to that approach. What are you going to do with an aircraft in this, in this market? You know, it's not so you can sell it easily. It's not that easy to, to collect. You're going to burn the relationship with the airline and potentially the manufacturer. Um, and from an accounting perspective, you're going to have big write downs coming into your books, which you might not, may not want to take. You know, compare that to a, a more passive approach where you maintain your relationship and you, you sort of preserve the best chance of long term recovery that that they're, they're sort of quite stark options. And, you know, you've got to work out whether you can cope without that short term cash for the for the benefit in the longer term. Um, you know, to me, the key is one having, you know, the underlying airline having a business with a strong management team and a strong plan and then coordination amongst the, the relevant stakeholders becomes critical. Um, and, and what the UK plan did on, on Virgin was bring all of those stakeholders to the table uh, in a relatively coordinated fashion so that that, that negotiation could be, could be thrashed out. You know, absent that, you know, I guess the worst place for, for, a, for a lessor to be is, is out in the cold and on your own without information or, or knowledge of what others are doing. Um, but given the nature of this crisis, I think it's going to bring everybody to the table for the benefit of, of all. And going back to my earlier point around the, the interconnectedness of the industry, you know, it's really important that um, uh, you know, there is coordination amongst lessors and amongst the wider stakeholder group in order to drive the better solutions. Yeah, I think, I think that that's a very important point. I mean, one of the things that strikes me about this, and, and I'm interested to hear what, what you and Stefan have to say about this, is, is that there are airlines out there who are trying to keep the lessors separated so that the lessors are not united, the lessors can't talk to each other, and they're trying to, to sort of play the lessors almost off against each other on the basis that it's almost a race to the bottom. Nobody wants to be the one left standing with the aircraft to repossess in, a, in an environment where you can't remarket, you can't sell the aircraft, that there's, there's really no alternatives. Is that something that we're going to see the airlines who play that game are going to suffer more than the other airlines who, who do talk to the creditors as a group? It, it, uh, Alan, if I may add, I, I totally agree with um, David's comments. Um, in fact, actually, when you look at uh, the paradigm here and uh, some of the things that have been done. Uh, airlines, in some cases, have come up with uh, rather draconian asks uh, for lender lessor community. And naturally, uh, the lender lessor community has resisted uh, uh, such asks. Um, but given the uniqueness of this crisis and also the fact that as David pointed out, this is essentially a zero-sum game. Um, everyone has to participate. I still believe, and I mentioned that before, uh, there should be a natural point uh, where uh, both airline and creditor interests sort of converge. Um, and, and that's simply because um, we have um, two, uh, you know, two sites which under understand very clearly, I think, from our perspective, of what we have experienced, uh, what's at stake, uh, what rights you have, uh, and uh, what leverage you have uh, in this process. Um, on the airline side, of course, leverage sits in the form of uh, uh, the understanding that nowadays you um, uh, will have a very difficult time repositioning and remarketing an asset. Uh, as opposed to uh, in prior uh, downturns where that wasn't the case, uh, where uh, the effect wasn't as global as it is today. So clearly that's leverage on the side of the airlines. On the other hand, though, uh, I think airlines are absolutely clear uh, of the fact that they do have a contractual agreement to, to, to uh, uh, abide by 
for a multi-year uh, uh, contractual payment stream that should accrue and should be paid to lessors or lenders. And in fact, uh, if, if you were to go in a direction of um, uh, unilaterally pausing payments, um, that usually creates, obviously creates a default, but, and not only default under this particular structure that you're stopping payment on, but in most instances, um, there's um, uh, you know, cross default provisions which will be activated, then this will end up being a domino effect across uh, multiples of contracts, uh, of leases and um, bank facilities. So that's a very dangerous game that uh, airlines, of course, are aware of and uh, uh, would uh, rather not go into. Uh, if they choose to go in that direction, of course, that would probably mean that they have to contend in court. And um, certainly that's not, uh, productive and uh, uh, will not lead uh, everyone in the right direction. So I echo David's uh, uh, words and yours, uh, Alan, that at the end of the day, this is, this is um, uh, a process which uh, if, if uh, both sides or every, every creditor class and the airline itself uh, pull in the same direction, uh, there is a solution on the horizon. Thank you very much. Um, Steve and Dominic, what, what are your views on the creditor coordination issue? And, and Dominic, perhaps more to you, to what extent can the, the lessors really talk to each other? Uh, we have had a question here about antitrust and competition law and, and whether the, the, the lessors speaking to each other would be in breach of that. Thanks, Alan. Um, yeah, I'll come to that question in a second. Um, but I mean, more generally, I think we've seen quite a positive trend so far of, of lessors coordinating in some, or rather coordinating more with each other um, in some shape or form. Um, I, 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 and this is just a personal view, but I, you know, um, sometimes restructurings feel like a kind of a game of chess and, um, and, and it, it can be very hard to kind of at, at, at times, or, or sorry, very easy at times to kind of lose sight as to what your ultimate goal is. And, um, you know, we've been quite lucky in our firm to, you know, with our, with our maritime practice to kind of see, um, you know, see other sectors and how they've dealt with similar crises. Um, and I think, you know, the, the, the creditor coordination in some shape or form um, is very helpful in preserving value in the airline's business. Um, I mean, ultimately, um, from a creditor perspective, you want to make sure that you've got future um, business. Um, and so um, the airline surviving, I mean, you know, obviously it needs to be with an airline that has a good business plan. But if an airline has a good business plan, um, uh, then, then it's, it's in your interest as a creditor to see that that business survives um, in order to um, harness um, the future uh, rentals that that business may uh, provide you. Um, and, so, and so really it comes down to what is the best way to preserve value. And preserving value, of course, in the airlines business also means uh, preserving value um, as a lessor in your assets, in your aircraft. I mean, there's a there's a difference in valuation depending on whether an, an aircraft is on lease or off lease. If it's on lease, it's generally more valuable. Um, and so um, if you can, if, you know, if you take a sort of a longer term view as a creditor, um, you're actually sort of helping your own balance sheet as well as a lessor because you've got these aircraft that, that, that stand a better chance of remaining on lease with the airline. Um, and I think sometimes, certainly at the start of the crisis, um, maybe that wasn't sort of obvious. Um, you know, uh, I think I think some some lessors may have initially taken the view that you know we'd like to pre we'd like to preserve claims over over, over preserving value. And so um, I think, sorry, to go back to my um, original um, opening line there, um, I think it's been really positive to see. Um, creditors and in particular lessors who I don't think really have been in this situation before unlike uh, banks say um, where they are able to start sort of coordinating in some shape or form and as I said right at the start I think that we've got a long way to go in terms of um, how that can be refined even more and what um, 
what processes, what restructuring proceedings or arrangements we'll see in the future that will in many ways kind of cajole lessors into um, coordinating in a way um, that works best for everybody, not just um, the airline debtor, but also for them as creditors. Um, so um, going to the going to the, the question I think uh, that was asked, uh, given antitrust and competition or globally, how might the less sort of, and I think you moved it back to it, but generally the question was about, um, you know, how can lessors coordinate without tripping over antitrust and competition laws? I mean, it's a very good question. And um, I mean, I, I'm speaking as, you know, should just say straight off the bat, I'm speaking as a transactional lawyer, not as an antitrust or competition um, law specialist. But um, I would point out, first of all, that creditor coordination in restructurings is nothing new. It's happened, as I said before, in maritime. Banks have whole restructuring teams. The LMA has, um, has template letters for uh, credit, uh, creditor coordination committees. And so um, there is clearly a, a, a space um, within, you know, without tripping over or violating antitrust and competition laws that creditors, including lessors, can, can coordinate with one another in a way um, that is highly lawful. And indeed, you know, if you look at this from the point of view of who's being harmed, um, which is often the, per the perspective taken in antitrust and competition laws, this is a way of avoiding harm. So, um, you know, uh, without, you know, um, without having, you know, without being a specialist in this area, I would say that there is clearly a path forward in order to do it. And I think um, you would obviously be working very closely with your competition and antitrust specialists um, to make sure that, you know, you don't trip up over anything. Um, but it's certainly doable. Thank you. All right, Stephen, last but not least. Well, no, I know. Look, and I, I would echo um, a lot of what Dominic said. I mean, we, at the start of the crisis, put together um, a fairly long report about um, what we saw as the emerging trends in aviation restructuring. Um, and it's interesting because the antitrust question and the competition question was one that we actually devoted a small section of the report to because we we, we knew that it was an issue for, for, for the lessors. And... Um, I'm not going to test my memory of what we actually wrote then, um, but I agree with Dom that, that, that we, having, having thought about that issue, we did see a way through. Um, I'm not saying that it's um, necessarily a terribly easy issue to wrestle with for a um, creditor class like the lessors, who, who, who otherwise could be, um, in, in, in perhaps in good times, a position um, to, to, to have some level of, 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 of antitrust concerns. But I think in the world in which we um, currently are, there are um, ways through the what is sometimes quite a labyrinthine sort of set of, of, of rules. Um, but there are ways through for you to um, do what might, necess might be necessary to, to, to frankly save a business as opposed to, as Dom says, harm a business um, and avoid harm. And therefore, um, look, it's a, it's, it's a great question and it's clearly a big issue. Um, but there are answers to it, um, but they, they will require some subtlety to, um, to implement. But I think sort of more generally on this, I think um, uh, echoing, I think, some of the, the, the comments that we've, 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 we've already heard and some of the themes that have, have emerged from this discussion, we're, we're very much at the moment in the foothills of climbing a mountain. This is, a, 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 this is going to be a large task, whether it will be done in a year or whether it will need a number of years, um, there's a lot of work to be done, a lot of climbing to be done. We've started to see a few um, models emerge, um, uh, actually across the aviation industry, and we've seen um, uh, large formal restructurings of um, Virgin Atlantic, which clearly has, has set out a model um, across what I think David was talking about in terms of, of, of um, a model to deal with the entirety of an airline's issues. Um, where you're not just focusing on the lessors on one particular issue, you're looking at the whole, the whole piece of it. Um, we've also seen um, uh, um, um, models with, with, with what happened with Norwegian, and we've seen some things happen in the lessor community with NAC. So we're, we're starting to see people take 
um, positive steps and find solutions. Um, but I think the one thing that that can be said with 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 some uh, with some certainty and, and, and sort of drawing on um, restructuring experience across sectors and over the years is that um, we've got a few models and a few solutions now. We're going to see other solutions and other models emerge as well, um, and we're going to find lots and lots of different situations which need their own particular solution. Um, and so. Um, everything might um, uh, rhyme or it will be variations on themes, but I think we're going to see um, quite a lot of innovation um, still to come. And I think um, just picking up on Dom's point about, about cooperation, um, it's not an easy thing to do, but it is central to any restructuring. Um, if you want to avoid insolvency and you want a restructuring which delivers a viable business uh, on the other side and that deals with the problems, frankly, everybody has to pull together. Um, it's a difficult and, and sometimes painful process, and it, 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 it's not necessarily one that won't be gone through without a little bit of shouting um, uh, from, from both sides. But um, frankly, um, a restructuring is all about reaching a solution that, frankly, the majority of people can live with um, and, and works for, 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 for the majority of people. And I think that is, um, uh, that is the, uh, the, the, the thing that we will see. Steve. Um, I'm conscious of time. David, just very briefly, we haven't talked about one other key player here, and that's airports as creditors. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that in the context of the current discussions not between airports and lessors, airlines and lessors? Yeah, I mean, I think, Alan, they're just part of the ecosystem that needs to be considered in, in each of these restructurings. You know, part, part of what they're, I mean, they're effectively car parks at the moment, uh, a lot of them, and that's been their, their part of their role to play. But they've got their own financing challenges as well. Um, and, and I think, you know, when I talk about a, a sort of connected or interrelated ecosystem, airports are a key part of that. In the UK, you know, they, they have had access to much cheaper government lending through their local authority or historical local authority ownership, um, which has helped some of the smaller regional airports. Uh, and in the US, although I'm by no means an expert here, there, there, I understand there is some move to enable private ownership um uh, alongside federal ownership of, of various airports and, and so that's just another part of the stakeholder map uh, that needs to be considered in, in in working through the problem thank you all right um one question we've had is about the role of the ecas in restructuring and whether they will have a, a special or a or role or be seen just as another form of lenders um who would like to answer that dominic yeah i don't mind taking that i mean I think we'll obviously see um, after a long period of, uh, of um, hiatus of ECA supporting uh, EC, ECA supported financings in the industry. I think we, we're certainly going to see um, many more ECA supported financings going forwards um, as we enter sort of more difficult times, which is which is you know entirely normal from an ECA perspective. You know that that's that's part of their job to kind of step in. Um, during difficult times and help stimulate the, the, the markets. Um, I mean, I think, I think the other thing to mention here is, is, is this time around we've got, we've also got sort of ECA-like uh, products like AFIT and Spouthers are, so it'd be interesting to see what roles they play. And of course, that, that those, um, those insurers um, are not bound by the same OECD ASU um, rules that the ECAs are bound by and so so again it'd be interesting to see how that plays out how they compete with the ECA product or, or uh, supplement it um, but yeah I mean generally I, I think I think we'll see an uptick in ECA supported financings um, and, and and a corresponding downtick uh, at least for now in um, in sort of highly structured products uh, that are more popular when the market is doing well yeah I mean I think the ECAs have got or, or can take a more macro approach and they're going to be impacted at various different levels, you know, from the manufacturer upwards. Um, and so you, whilst whilst they are sort of to some extent a normal creditor, they, they probably have a longer term view on the industry and, and I think should be seen as part of or, or certainly a, a key uh, pillar of part of the solution. And if I may add a couple of things on that, uh, obviously it's the ECAs and uh, their counterparts um, on the other side of the Atlantic, uh, XM. Um, I think um, 
there's shortage of capital uh, to finance transactions uh, uh, right now. We've seen uh, uh, you know a lot of uh, capital providers pause uh, given the pandemic. Some have actually jumped in. We've seen transactions being done um, uh, uh, mostly in the form of uh, sale leasebacks. But uh, when it comes to uh, supporting the new deliveries that are coming um, to airlines and lessors, of course, I think the ECAs and uh, XM will play a uh, tremendous role still there. And uh, they're a very, very important part of the financing chain there. Thank you, Stefan. Now we're running close to the end of time. What I might ask each of you to do very briefly is, is to tell us what you think the, the future holds. So in a few years' time, if we look back on this, what, what skills, what, what lessons will airlines and lessors and other creditors have learned? Let's start with David. Yeah, look, I think, or I hope it's that sort of um, the importance of the ecosystem and, and um, you know, mutual benefit of, of working through a difficult period together. Um, I think that uh, you know, from a legal perspective, we, we talked about crystal ball gazing in terms of doing the restructuring. I suspect there'll be a bit of crystal ball drafting in, in the next round of contracts as, as, you know, people don't see a global pandemic as, as unlikely and needing to be, to be drafted around. Um, so I think a bit more flexibility in the structures uh, and a bit more flexibility in, in, in the mechanisms used to deal with, um, uh, you know, industry-wide solutions will be hopefully some of the learning points. Yeah, and, and, and from my perspective, uh, we, again, circling all the way back to the beginning of this uh, discussion, uh, this is clearly an unprecedented uh, pandemic, and I think unprecedented events usually drive uh, innovation. And as we've heard um, from all the panelists here, I think uh, we will see uh, structures in place which probably will be innovative and will try to solve uh, a lot of the things that currently are not uh, solvable uh, uh, in various jurisdictions. Um, uh, of course, uh, you know, we have the consensual type uh, arrangements and of course on the other side of the spectrum we have chapter 11, but somewhere in between, I think a lot of uh, uh, structures will emerge which will probably accommodate um, these sorts of restructurings that are imminent uh, and um, I believe will be uh, um, uh, forthcoming shortly. Uh, so, uh, you know, coordination, collaboration uh, is probably a key here. And um, uh, the fact that this ends up being a protracted, most likely a protracted uh, um, um, uh, pandemic and, and crisis, um, we will probably see um, a huge impacts on uh, the value of aircraft, uh, aircraft leases, things like that. So, um, that may have uh, a massive effect uh, uh, in reshuffling and uh, uh, repositioning uh, certain assets. Um, and also when you look at it from a perspective of um, um, the type of flying we will see, no one knows, but uh, the question is the jury still out there whether business travel will come back as strong as it has been and that may have an impact on how uh, airlines structure their uh, uh, strategies going forward. Thank you. Uh, Stephen? And I think I just sort of really echo what David and Stefan have already said. I think um, when, we, when we come out of this, there will be a new paradigm in the aviation industry. It will be, um, it will have learned how to, 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 to do restructurings. Um, which has been probably part of the, the chapter 11 in the US experience, but it's probably been less of an experience around the world. Um, and, and I think Dominic will um, be able to speak to this more than I can, but, but the whole idea of, of, of repossess and redeploy as the, the main um, uh, tool in the toolkit will, will be um, uh, not, not the case. There will, be, there will be other solutions that people will have learned how to implement. And I think that will be, um, incredibly valuable for the industry and hopefully will enable more um, value to be to be preserved through through the inevitable downturns that will come even if it's not a pandemic it, it, it's always something um, and I think that will be what we see. Thank you. Dominique. 
I, I don't have anything to add really. I mean, I think Stephen captured my sentiments um, almost perfectly. I, I, I think that the, the, I think everyone in the industry will come out with new skills. I think we'll see, as um, Stefan said, you know, new innovation in terms of, um, uh, you know, what comes next, what financial products comes next. Also innovation, um, legally um, and tech and from a technological standpoint from an operational standpoint I think we're going to be forced to look more closely for example at um, environmental concerns as an industry um, and so we may see a period of um, sort of introspection and, 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 and seeing how we can tackle that um, but I think generally um, we'll come out of this feeling stronger um, and I think that's that's a positive message Great. All right. Thank you very much. Well, um, we have some more questions which we will answer separately. Um, as we're running close to time, I'd like to thank each of the speakers and, and to all of you who have joined us today for this very interesting discussion on aviation restructuring. Um, if you have any more questions or, or anything to add, please reach out to me or to one of the speakers directly um, and we'll be happy to respond. Uh, if you have dialed into this webinar, please email us at events at wfw.com so we know that you attended. Um, tomorrow we will send out a short email sending out the slides and some links to relevant articles and a feedback survey. Um, your feedback is important to us to make sure that the events we, we hold are relevant and engaging uh, and respond to industry needs. Um, this, is, this was the first of our aviation uh, webinars and we have two more coming up next month on private equity and alternative assets in aviation. Uh, so please keep an eye out for the invitation for episode two, which we'll be sending out shortly. Um, if you would like more information on the transport webinar series, please also check our website. Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs>